Okay? So why don't we all bow our heads and let's commit our time to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that, Father God, this is your work. And we just want to give glory and honor to you for how you have been blessing our ministry in Tagum. Father, we also pray that you will continue to grow the church as you have done here in Davao, as you have done in other churches in CCF all over the Philippines, not only here in the Philippines, but even outside of the Philippines. So, Father, we commit that ministry into your hands. We also pray for our event for Elevate, the high school, college ministry. I pray that as they continue to reach out and touch more lives, Father, I pray that you will just uh, minister to those who will come for the first time. Also, Lord, as we continue with our worship service, I pray, O oh God, that you will bless our time as we again look at your word. Use your Holy Spirit. Use your word. Use me, Father, as you have blessed my preparation. I pray, O oh God, that I'll be able to deliver it with power, with clarity. And I pray that the very words that come out of my mouth are the very words that you want your people to hear. We now commit our time to you. Bless it, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we pray. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. We are still in our series on the book of Genesis. Okay, what chapter are we in now? Can you remember what chapter? We're in chapter 14, okay? Folks, as you look around the world, you will see that there are so many conflicts that are happening. There are wars happening in Afghanistan. There's a threat of war in Ukraine. Uh, Putin is trying to um, maybe attack Ukraine. There's now a threat. Okay, coming from China. So even in a report by Pentagon to Congress, they are saying that there is a possible scenario that China will exert its power. So matter of fact, meetings are happening now, not only to prepare China economically, but they want to be prepared militarily. And so one scenario that that report said to Congress is, what if, what if China tries to take over Taiwan. And so they show a different scenarios, maybe a blockade, and the number of troops in the side of China is about 400,000. In the other side, Taiwan, they have only 130,000. And folks, Taiwan is one of the biggest purchasers of military equipment from the U.S. And so because why? They want to protect themselves. So there's always the threat of war. Okay? Why am I sharing that? Because in chapter 14 of Genesis, if you have your Bible, please open to Genesis chapter 14. This is the first recorded battle in the Bible. Okay? So, and really we are in a war. Okay? Not, not, not only physically, but according to uh, an author by Donald Gray Barnhouse, he says this, we are in a war, and it is a war between what? Light and darkness, good and evil, God and Satan, and angels and demons. And so as we look, ladies and gentlemen, on this passage on the book of Genesis, chapter 14, we see here the first battle recorded in the Bible. So this morning, I want to entitle my message, Spiritual Warfare, Restoring a fallen brother. Okay? Now, you can divide this chapter into two. Okay? Let me show you the division. Genesis 14, 1 to 16, the war of the kings. Okay? I will show that to you. The war of the kings. And then the balance of Genesis 14, 17 to 24, is Abraham is blessed by Melchizedek. Okay? Ab Abraham is blessed by Melchizedek. So, Let's look first at the war of the kings so that you understand, okay? Now, as we look at this, this is an event. It looks like as if this is just a secular event. There's just a war. But folks, as we look at this, we will see principles that we can learn, okay? And hopefully, as we look at chapter 14, you will learn some principles on spiritual warfare, okay? So if you have your Bible, Genesis chapter 14, let's begin with verse 1, okay? 
Verse 1. It came about that in the days of Amrapel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, and then Cherdor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Golem. So how many kings are there? Number one, king of Shinar. Number two, king of Elazar. Number three, king of Elam. And then number four, Tidal, king of Goim. So folks, we have four kings. Okay, four kings. And then in verse two, it says, they made war. See, this is the first war recorded in the Bible. They made war with whom? Five kings also. So four kings versus five kings. Who's the first king? We have Bera, king of Sodom, and then Bersha, king of Gomorrah. And then we have Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Sebuim, and then the king of Bela, that is in Soar. So four kings versus five kings. Okay, now for us to understand where they are, okay, the first four kings are from the north, okay, above Damascus. These text five kings, according to this map, okay, notice you have Zoar, Bela, there's a king there. Of course, we don't see where uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Sebuim is, but they say this is the possible site. So these five kings are located south of the Dead Sea. Okay? So you have there the, uh, where they are. And these four kings are way, way, way above. Okay? Above Damascus. Okay? So the Sea of Galilee, you have Dan, and then you have Damascus on top. Okay? So they made war. The four kings, five, uh, five, four kings made war with whom? The five kings. Okay? So this is what happened. Now, Verse 4 says, 12 years they have served Serdor Laomer. Okay? These five kings have been under this king from the north. Okay? But, but, something happened. On the 12th year, or the 13th year, what did they do? They rebelled. Maybe they finally said, enough is enough. We don't want to be under you. So they said, we want to rebel against you. Now, if you were the four kings, what would you do? Of course, you want to take control, right? You want to make sure that you're always in control of these people. Okay, so verse 8. The king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Seboim and the king of Bela, that is Sor, came out and what did they do? Since they were rebelling against these four kings, they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidem. Okay, so folks... They wanted to rebel, so what did they do? They arrayed themselves for battle. Against whom? Well, look at verse uh, against uh, 9. Okay, Against Sir Chedor Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, the king of Shinar, the king of Elisar. Four kings against how many? Five. Okay, so you now have a situation where these five kings, who used to be under these four kings... They are now rebelling and they want to fight them. Okay? Now what happened? What happened? Let's see. Okay? What happened? Verse 10. Now in the valley of Sidim was, the, was full of tar pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So in short, they were what? Defeated by these four kings. And but those who survived fled to the hill country. So they were defeated by the four kings. Verse 11. So the victor, there's a, there's a system in the past. If you are the victor, what happens? You get everything. You get the people. You get all the goods. So, verse 11, these four kings, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their food supply, and they departed. Why? Because they won. Okay? So when these five kings rebelled against these four kings, they were defeated, and, and their policy is very simple. If you are the winner or the victor, you get everything. You get the spoils. You get the people. You get the food. You get everything. And so they departed. Okay? So, verse 12. What happened? They also, okay, took who? 
Lot. Do you remember who Lot is? Who is Lot? Abraham's nephew. Okay? And last Sunday, I think uh, Brother Ferdy shared with us that they need to separate, right? Okay? There was a conflict. There was a strife between their people. And so God had to cause that conflict so that Lot can be one, can separate from Abraham. Okay? And, and Abraham, the uncle, made the deal of the century. He told Lot, Lot, okay, if you go to the north, I go to the south. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Okay? Choose. And what did Lot choose? He chose the valley, right? Where there's water, where there is what? Grass to feed his flock. Okay? So, they also took Lot and Abraham's nephew and his what? His possession. And they departed. Why? Why was Lot involved in this? Because he was living in Sodom. Okay? Remember, I don't know if you remember, in chapter 13, he decided to live near Sodom. Not really in Sodom. But here in chapter 14, he was now living where? In Sodom. Okay? Inside. Inside Sodom. And so when these four kings attacked Sodom and Gomorrah, he was part of the spoil. Okay? Now, let's continue. Okay? Verse 13. Then a fugitive came. Somebody escaped, okay? And told Abraham, the Hebrew, okay? Now, he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eschol, and the brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abraham. Okay, so he heard that there was an attack, and then because of that attack, his nephew Lot was included, okay, as the captives. So, folks... In this story, this is just a secular story, but we can get principles with regards to spiritual warfare, okay? But before I share you the principles, let's ask our question first. What should Abraham do about Lot? Now, he heard Lot was taken captive, his family, everything that he possessed, taken by these four kings. If you were Lot, or if you were Abraham, what would you do? Hearing this, oh, your nephew has fallen. He's now with these four kings. What would you do? Two possible reasons that uh, Abraham would put in his mind. First, he would probably say, I will not touch him. Why? That's not my problem, right? That's not my, that's not my war, okay? Between the four kings and the five kings. So, that's not my war. Why will I get involved in that war? Is that a possible reason? Yes or no? Another reason that he would probably say is this. Okay, Lot, you are now captive. That is your own doing. Right? You went there. You live in Sodom because you decided to live in Sodom. Then, that's the result of your decision. Could he say that? I think so. Okay? And some of us folks, we do that. We see a brother, you know that that brother or sister is going in a direction and it, you know that it will cause trouble to that person. What would you do? Would you restore? Or would you say, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. That's her problem. If he wants, if he wants to go to that direction, that's not my problem. As a mapback, you could also say, well, she decided to do that. But folks, you cannot do that. So the principle that we want to understand is this. Notice what Abraham did. Instead of saying, this is not my problem, he decided on that, so that is the result or the consequence of what he decided on. Notice what Abraham do, did. Okay, verse 14. When Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, okay, taken captive, what did he do? He led out his trained men and they went in pursuit as far as what? Dan. Now, why did he do that? Why did Abraham do that? Some say it's because uh, he had faith in God. I think it's more of family. It's more of family. If you know your family is in distress and in crisis, what will you do? You'll go out of your way. 
right? And help. Similarly, we are members of the family of God. We are brothers and sisters. So when you hear a brother, when you hear a sister in distress, what will you do? You do something. Okay? You do something. Okay? So, what did he do? He pursued them, and then he divided his forces against them at night. He and his servants, and they did what? They defeated them and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. They're already up there. Okay? So, that's what Abraham, Abraham did. Okay? Now, verse 16. Okay? Verse 16. He brought back all the goods, also brought back his relative lot with his possession, and also the women and the people. So, there's a phrase that is repeated, brought back. Again, it's repeated, brought back. Okay? So, folks, that is 1 to 16. So, let me summarize. There are four kings, and there are five kings, and these five kings used to be under the four kings for 12 years. They rebelled against the four kings. They arrayed themselves in battle. The four kings fought with them. They were defeated, and so the victor carries all the spoils, including Lot and his family and his possession. And when Abraham heard about it, what did he do? He pursued them. He fought them and brought back his nephew Lot with all his possession and his relatives and with uh, the women and the people. Okay? So that's the story. Now what is the spiritual principle that we can get from this story? In a spiritual warfare, ladies and gentlemen, number one that we need to understand is that we need to restore a fallen brother. When you have a brother that has is falling into sin, what do we need to do? We need to what? Restore that brother. Because remember, Satan is our enemy. We are under attack. If he is successful to cause us to sin, folks, that is victory for him. But our part is this. We need to what? Restore a fallen brother. Do you know people like that? You know that they're in a situation that Based on your analysis, you know that they are headed for trouble. As a matter of fact, maybe you know people already who are in trouble. They have fallen. What do you do? Do you, do you just say, that's not my problem? He made that decision. Therefore, he will suffer the consequence. And many times we do that. Why? Because we don't want to be bothered. But folks, we are in a war. And therefore, when you see a brother falling or a sister falling, what must we do? We need to what? Restore back. Okay? So, here are the principles that I see in this, the first part of Genesis 14. Number one, there is the danger of what? Compromise. The danger of compromise. Where do you see that? Notice in verse 12. They also took who? Lot. Why? Because he was living in Sodom. He was living in Sodom. He was, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah is so evil. Right? Why will you go into a place that you know that is dangerous? Understand? And some of us, some of you are here today. You know it's dangerous, but you want. You want to go there. You want to go to that relationship. Your mother and your father is already telling you not that relationship. Be careful. But what do you do? I'm in love. He's the right guy for me. But your parents said, no, 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 no. I, I, I hear that here in the church. I hear that D group leaders asking me, Pastor Bob, what will I do with this member of mine? I said, what's the problem? We have a relationship with this person, but we know that you know, we know the history. We know what's the problem. We try to counsel, but does not listen. Have you experienced that? I counseled one member of ours. She's not here anymore. I said, why are you going to get married with this guy? He's not even a believer. Why? Why disobey God? God said, never be an equally yoked with an unbeliever. What does light and darkness have in common? Would you want to violate that? Would you want to disobey God? 
will not answer. Just look at you. But still, they continue. She continues with the decision. I don't know why. Folks, it happens. Be careful. Sometimes, we follow our emotions. We don't follow the Word of God. And because we follow our emotion, it clouds the commands of God. And He said, no, no, I want to be happy. This is the right guy for me. This is the right decision. As a matter of fact, you will say, I remember when I was in Manila, and, you know, a wife called me up and said, Pastor Bob, can you help me? I said, what's your problem? My husband is with another woman. So I called this friend of mine and said, can we, can, can we meet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, let's meet. So I went, we met, and I told him frankly, straight into his face, I heard that you have another woman other than your wife. You know what, she, what, you know what he said, to, what he told me? Yeah, Bob, I prayed for this for one year, and God has answered my prayer. Ah, oh, amazing. It's an answer to prayer. See, folks, never. You have to understand the danger of compromising. So check your decision. Is this a wise decision? Because if it is not a wise decision, then don't decide on that. And, and Lot, in his mind, self-interest, wow, plain, the valley, the water, the grass for my, my flock went there. It was okay so far when he was outside of Sodom. But he decided to live where? Inside Sodom. And because he was there, what happened? Was there a consequence? Yes. So when the four kings attacked the five kings, what happened? He was included in the spoil. Sometimes we don't see the consequence. Other people see that. We don't see it. So when somebody tries to restore us, you need to listen. Why? Because maybe there is wisdom in what they're saying. Rather than, you know, trust your feelings. So folks, the danger of what? Compromise. And when we make decisions, sometimes we think that decision is okay now. But can I tell you, let's read this statement. Go. History weighs on the decisions of men. You might think it's okay. Wait a little while, wait a little while, and then you will now say, ah, wrong decision. Why? Because the consequence happens when? After. It happens after. That's why we have the saying, right? Sahuli ang pagsisisi. Regret happens at the later part. Why? Because the consequence does not happen immediately. You might think it's okay. But as you go on and history, ladies and gentlemen, weighs down on the decisions that we will make. Our lives are made up of the decisions that we make every day. So my challenge to all of you is this. Make wise decision. Make wise decision. Why? Don't compromise. Because, ladies and gentlemen, for sure there is what? Consequence. Second principle that I can get from this story about this war between the four and the five kings. Demands of love. The demands of love. If you're a believer... Love demands that we reach out to a fallen brother. Don't let them just suffer. Reach out to them. Why? Because that is the demand of love. And Abraham was willing to do and risk his life and risk the lives of his men to pursue these four kings. Why? Because he wants to want rescue Lot. I read, so I, I read a commentary, and this guy was so you know fascinated with titles. He said, "You know what? Genesis 13. If I were to title it the message last Sunday, he said, Genesis 13. I would have entitled it, Abraham has, uh, Abraham has to uh, has lot to lose. Okay, and then in chapter 14, 
because he wants to rescue Lot. He, he would have entitled this message, Abraham has a lot to gain. Okay? Because he has to rescue, right? But folks, why do we help a fallen brother and sister? You know why? Because it, love demands it. Okay? And notice what Abraham did. He led out his what? Trained. He led out his trained men born in his what? In his house. Okay? Folks, love demands that we help a fallen brother. Why? Because love cares enough to get involved even at the risk of being hurt. That is the demand of love. Also, if you love someone, if you love someone, you cannot sit around while he or she destroys himself or herself through sin. So if you see a sinning brother, love cannot sit around and say, aha, she decided on that, it's up to her, there's a consequence to that, I told her that, so I will not move, I will not do anything. Folks, no. As Christians, as brothers and sisters, we need to want, don't sit around, but rather, reach out to that fallen brother or sister and help restore that fallen brother or sister back. Why? Because love demands it. Okay? Love demands it. Thirdly, another principle that I want us to learn, spiritual warfare in this story is this, the importance of what? Preparation. The importance of preparation. Why do I say the importance of preparation? Notice, when Abraham heard that Lot, his relative, was taken captive, what did he do? He led out his trained men. How many? Born in his house, 318. Meaning, these 318 men were ready anytime because Satan can attack us anytime. If you are not ready, ladies and gentlemen, then, as the saying goes, Sleeping soldiers are dead soldiers. Right? Sleeping soldiers are dead soldiers. If you're sleeping, that's why in the Bible you say, awake, be sober. Why? Because the enemy is there, ready to devour us. So if you are not ready, folks, then you're defeated. In war, we are always ready. And people or armies that are not ready are what? They're always defeated. That's why I remember the report of Pentagon. China is preparing. China is preparing for war. I don't know who is the enemy, but remember, they are now trying to get as much islands, okay, in the sparkly, uh, and it's threatening Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines. So, folks, they're preparing. So, spiritually, the same. Satan will always attack us. So, if you're not ready, then you're dead. Okay? Then you're dead. That's why in Ephesians, by the way, for those of you who have not taken the book of Ephesians, you have not studied it, please come join us on Thursday. Okay? Thursday, 7 o'clock, we are studying the book of Ephesians. We are still in chapter 2, so you can still catch up. Okay? There are six chapters there. So, here, what does it mean? What does it mean to be ready? Paul says this, put on what? The full armor of God. Why? So that you may be able to stand firm against the, the schemes, the methods of the devil. So if you're not ready, he can fool you. He can deceive you because one of the schemes of Satan is to deceive us. To make us think that it is okay. And I always tell all of you this. A person who is deceived does not know that he is deceived. Let me repeat. Huh? A person that is deceived does not know that he is deceived. Because if he knows that he is deceived, he is not anymore deceived. Understand? So be careful. You, are you ready? So how do we know that we don't fall into the schemes of Satan? 
put on the full armor of God. I cannot go on uh, the description of the full armor. Join us in uh, or read chapter 6 so that you understand what are this armor, the helmet, the sword, the breastplate, the shoes, the belt. Folks, we need to be what? Ready. Okay? Because, why? Why do we need to be ready? Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So tell the person beside you, you are not my enemy. If it is your spouse, you say, you are not my enemy. And if the person says, but I am your enemy. But Jesus said, love your enemy, right? Folks, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Who is our enemy? Look, but our enemy is rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is our enemy. After a Bible study last Friday in uh, Tagum, somebody came up to me and said, you know, my neighbor, people around us say that she is a witch. So, so, remember manananggal? You know what's, I don't know what's manananggal in English. It's a half-bodied uh, uh, ghost, okay? Meaning the, the lower part and the upper part separates and they fly, okay? So I said, what's your question? My question is this, Pastor Bob. Does this kind of witch, no manananggal, do they read the Bible? I think so, I said. But let me ask you a question first. Why do you say that that person is a witch or a ghost? Everybody, because the grandmother and the, you know. I said, you need to talk to the person first. Don't assume that that person is a witch, right? So we started talking about events. Are, are these real? Are these ghosts? Uh, you know, when somebody dies, remember when somebody dies, the relatives will say this, Oh, I saw the papa past. I saw mama, you know, walk past by me. Is that, what is that? I said, you know what? Just go back to the Bible. When it is appointed for men to die, how many times? Once. And after that, judgment. So how can they float and walk? They're already judged. They're either in heaven or they're either in hell. So how can they float and you know, manifest themselves? And then we immediately say, wow, maybe there is an unfinished business that we need to do, that he needs to do. That's why he wants to remind us and shows us, manifest to us, because maybe there is an unfinished business. And I told them, you know what? All of these things, these are true. These are real. But these are the schemes of who? The devil. Remember what the Bible says. The Bible says, Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. So when you see an angel, don't assume immediately that that is a good angel. Maybe that is Satan disguising what? Himself as an angel of light. So my question to you is this, are you prepared? When spiritual warfare comes your way, when not Satan and his demon attack us, are you prepared? And so when you see a D-group member falling into sin, are you ready? Are you prepared to help that person? Are you ready? Galatians 6 verse 1 says this, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespasses, you who are spiritual. See, folks, we need to be spiritually okay. You who are spiritual, restore such a man in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you to be tempted. So are you ready? Abraham was ready. When he heard that Lot was held captive, Immediately, 318 trained men. This is his Delta Force. Okay? Ready at one command, they're ready. Why? Because spiritual warfare requires that we need to want prepare. Okay? We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. Okay? Another principle, the use of wisdom. The use of wisdom. So in restoring a fallen brother, we need to apply and use wisdom. Let's, where do we get that? In verse 15, he says, Notice, how did Abraham defeat this big army of the four kings with only 318 men? He had to use wisdom. Look, 
Verse 15, He divided His forces against them by night. The best way to attack is what? In the cover of darkness. And maybe these armies were rejoicing. Wow, we defeated these five kings. Look at the spoils. Maybe they were drinking and enjoying themselves, thinking that they're okay. But because Abraham used wisdom to defeat them, okay? So they attacked them by night. And what happened? He defeated them and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. Folks, we need to apply what? Wisdom in restoring a brother. Because sometimes they are deceived. They think what they're doing is okay. So you need to apply wisdom so that you can help them see where they're going is trouble. Or where they are right now is not right. So going back to Galatians chapter 6, you who are spiritual, what is the wisdom? Restore such a brother in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Because some of us, we help. You know what? What you're doing is really wrong. Huh? I already told you that. Now look what's happening to you. Folks, don't do that. Help them see. Help them see. Coach them. Allow them to see that what they're doing is not right. And allow them to process it in such a way that they make action plans based on their decision, not your decision, so that when a person makes his action plan on his own, he will definitely do that. Rather than you telling them what to do. Because oftentimes, when people tell us what to do, we don't want that, right? You know, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And oftentimes, it does not happen. Why? Because they're being told. But if they process it themselves and they understand their problem because you're helping them, applying wisdom, restoring them into, with gentleness, and I think the success will be higher if you apply wisdom. Understand? That is what Abraham did in rescuing Lot. Okay? He applies what? Strategy. Okay? But at the same time, each one looking to yourself, lest you be what? Tempted. Okay? So, use wisdom in restoring a fallen brother. Another principle I see here is this. Act on principle and not on results. Act on principles and not on results. What, that, what does that mean? Let me explain. Okay? Remember this, verse 16. After he defeated the four kings, what did Abraham do? He brought back what? All the goods and also brought back his relative lot with his possession and also the women and the people. So after defeating the four kings, rescuing Lot and his family and everything that he has, he brought them back. Question, question, where did Abraham bring back Lot and company and all his possession? What's the answer? Where did he bring them back? What's the answer? Where? You don't know? Where? Back to where? Sodom. Back to Sodom. Because in later on, the next few weeks, we'll study the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis chapter 18, we will see that Lot is still living where? In Sodom. Now, folks, what can we learn here? Remember I said, act on principle, not on results. Because sometimes we help a brother, a sister was fallen... Because why? Love demands it. But sometimes as we help this brother or sister was fallen, we are not assured that they will really change. They might go back to the same situation that they're in. If you notice in Genesis 14, Lot does not even thank his uncle. He said, thank you, uncle, uncle Abe, for helping me. I think I should not stay in Sodom because there will be problems there. I would think I probably will just stay here so that it will not happen again. And many of us don't want to help a brother and a sister because in your mind, it, he or she will go back to the same problem again. You tell that person, separate from this guy. Don't have a relationship. Maybe you're successful there, but here comes another guy, the same character as the first guy, and he will look at, wow, this is the right guy again. The same problem happens. 
But then you will tell yourself, I will not help you again. Why? You just go back. Folks, continue to help even if the person goes back. Understand? Why? Because love demands it. Love demands it. So we need to help one another. And at the same time, it is also for your benefit. Do you know that? As you help a fallen brother and sister, even if he does not repent and change, and still goes back to the same pit where he or she uh, came from, you need to do that. Why? Because it is for our benefit. Can I tell you why? Or look at this passage. Let's read verse 30. Go. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he shall die since you have not what? Warned him. He and his righteous deeds which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I will require at your hand. So in short, when a brother or sister commits iniquity and God is putting a block and you don't warn the person, God is telling us, his blood I will require at your hand. Why? Because you did not warn him. But, however, verse 21, however, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, you have a brother, a sister, you know he's sinning, and you tell him, you know what you're doing is not right. You're sinning against God. You need to deal with that. And he does not sin, meaning you were successful in convincing him, he shall surely live. Why? Because he took the warning. And notice the bottom. Because you warn him, you have delivered yourself. So folks, even if, remember the principle, act on principle, not on result. If you see a sinning brother, a sinning sister, Warn. Why? Even if he does not respond, continue to pray. Continue to help. If you have the opportunity to restore that fallen brother, do it. Why? It's also for your own good. God will not require it of you. You have been delivered yourself. So folks, restoring a fallen brother, that's the first part. As we look at the second part, Genesis chapter 14, verse 17, there is another war that we will see. Okay? There's another war. What is that? Look, verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Chedor Laumair and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sabeh, that is the king's valley. Where is that? Okay? So remember, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is in that area. Where is the Valley of Shabeh? Up there. Okay? So the king of Sodom, well, well, Abraham and company came back, okay? They meet at the Valley of Shabeh. Okay? And then he also meets another king. What's the name? Melchizedek. Okay? Melchizedek, king of Salem. Where is Salem? Okay? See that up, up there beside the valley of Shaveh? So, when the king of Sodom met Abraham, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, also met Abraham. By the way, Melchizedek is mentioned only three times in the Bible. Okay? And he's described as the king of righteousness okay king of righteousness so melchizedek king of salem brought out bread and wine and what how is melchizedek described he is a priest of the god most high now this is the first time that the name god most high is mentioned in the bible what is the meaning of the god most high it comes from the hebrew word el elyon what does that mean? It refers to the God above all other gods, supreme ruler and lord of all universe. Okay? He's the priest. I don't know how he became a priest, but he, Melchizedek is described as a priest of the God Most High. 
He is God who reigns far above the false gods of the pagans. So, Melchizedek is a priest of the God Most High. What happened in this encounter? Okay? So, two kings. Sodom, king of Sodom, king of Salem. Right? So, what did Melchizedek do? He blessed what? Abraham. What's the blessing? He said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. So Melchizedek, as he meets Abraham, blesses him. He said, Blessed be Abraham by whom? By the God most high, the creator of heaven and earth. And then he continues the blessing. And blessed be God most high, who, who what? Delivered you from your enemies, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Melchizedek is now reminding Abraham, Abraham, be careful. You might be thinking, Galingko, I'm good. I'm really good. Why? Imagine, 318 trained men versus a vast army of four kings. Is that possible? Is that possible? Abraham will think that way. He would have probably said, oh, 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 Melchizedek, now wait, wait, wait a minute. God helps those who help themselves. Let us give credit where credit is due. Right? That's why Melchizedek reminds Abraham the God most high, the supreme God of the universe. Never, never think that the glory belongs to you. The glory belongs to whom? To God. Folks, here is another battle that we see. This is not a physical battle. This is a battle internally that happens to each one of us. Okay? Number two, godly conscience versus moral compromise. It could have been very easy for Abraham to get all the glory. Understand? And say, wow, I'm really good. I'm a good trainer. I train these 380 men. I'm a good military strategist. I attack at night, defeated these four kings, brought all the spoils back. I'm really, really good. Can, is that possible? Yes. That's why I reminded the people in Tagum. 106 people attended. Don't say, wow, we are good. Give God the glory. Why? Because the Bible says it is God who causes the growth. It is not us. We are just co-workers. So every time God blesses our ministry, who gets the glory? God. And that is what Abraham did. Because inside us, there is always that battle. My, 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 me, 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 myself versus giving the glory to God. Has God blessed you? If God has blessed you, give him credit. Give him honor. Don't say, wow, I'm really a good businessman. I'm really a good designer. I'm really a good whatever good. It is not coming from you. It's all coming from whom? From God. So, did he have victory? Okay. Abraham what? Gives glory to God rather than to himself. Okay. Gives glory to God. How did he do that? Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, let me transgress a little. Some pastors will teach this, okay? By the way, the word tenth, tenth, gave him a tenth of everything. In the King James Version, it says he gives him tithes of all, okay? And some pastors or teachers will prove text, verse 20, to defend their position that New Testament believers, Christians, us, should continue to give tithe because, notice, the tithe is mentioned here and the law has not yet even been given. We are still in the book of Genesis. The law was given in Exodus. So therefore, since we are not part of the law, we should not give tithes, right? Because we are now not by law but by grace. But because of this passage, they will say, you need to continue to give your tithe. But remember I told you, can you remember my sermon on the biblical prosperity? 
If you missed that, go to our website, CCF Dabao, look and listen to that message. Because we are not anymore under law. And if we use this text as a proof text for tithing in the New Testament, then we are wrong. Why? Can I, ask, can I tell you why? What did Moses mean when he writes tithes of all? All what? You need to ask that question. All what? And the book of Hebrews tells us, just think how great he was. This is Melchizedek. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of what? Of the plunder. Understand? Because if it is tithing, then he could have tithed all his possession. But he was not yet home. He was still going home. Understand? So he was giving tithing on the plunder, not his possession. Understand? So never use this text to say, oh, you still need to continue to tithe. Or use the word tithe in the New Testament. Okay? Our giving now is different. Okay? How are, how are we to give? How? As God has prospered us. If God has blessed you, then give more. Don't look at the 10% anymore. You can give 100% if you want. You, because if God has blessed you, then give as much. Understand? So, don't use this as a proof text. Okay? But, the giving of the tenth of the spoils is Abraham's way of publicly glorifying God. And remember, who were there? Who were there? The king of Sodom? Who else? The king of Salem? Melchizedek? And who else? Is Lot there? Yeah. And Lot is watching that. The king of Sodom is watching that. Wow. You're giving a tenth of the spoil. Why? Because one way of glorifying God is through what God has given us. So if God has blessed you, then use that blessing to bless others so that God gets the glory. But the moment you give and say, Lord, ah, Lord, I gave, huh? See, folks, the motive is very important. You can give, but your thinking is so that people will praise you. Problem. That's the battle inside us. Understand? But if your mindset is like Abraham, as you give, you always say, why are you helping? To God be the glory. Why are you doing this? To God be the glory, not me. Understand? So is that war raging inside you? As you minister, as you help in the church, as you sing here, or maybe do ministry, as you do the group, do you say, can you tap me at the back? I'm really good. Don't do that. We are just, as Pastor Peter will always say, we are just slaves. Slaves. And a slave does not need to be tapped at the back. Why? Because it's just what is expected of us, being slaves. Like, like a waiter. You call a waiter after, when you take lunch today. Call the waiter and say, can you give me water? Will he come or not? He will come. He will place water. And then will he say, tap me at the back? No, he will not do that. He will go. And then when you drink your water, you call him again, waiter. Then he comes back. Can you give me water again? Will he say, I just gave you water. Why are you asking water again? The waiter does not do that. Why? Servant. Servant. Understand? We are slaves. And the way we honor God and give Him glory is give by our giving. Understand? By our giving. Never get the glory. Give back the glory to whom? To God. Okay? Give back the glory to God. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, he's now giving Abraham an offer. What's the offer? Well, let's read the offer. Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Give the people to me and... Now, you need to remember that if you are the victor, what do you get? If you, if you are the victor, the victor always gets the spoil, Right? The people, the things, and everything. That is rightfully yours. And the king of Sodom was giving him an offer. I get back the people. All the rest is yours. He's trying to buy Abraham. Okay? But is the spoil rightly Abraham's? Remember, who won? Who defeated the four kings? Abraham. So that's rightfully his. Right? So, but notice, folks, 
Remember the battle that is waging within us? Godly conscience versus what? Versus moral compromise. You know what Abraham did? Abraham resist the temptation of success. Why? He could, now, by the way, is Abraham rich? I don't know if Ferdy shared with that or uh, Drew shared with you last Sunday. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Lot and Abraham were very what? Very rich. Very rich. And here is the spoil of a city that should be yours. So imagine how fabulously he will be so rich. Okay? And that's a temptation. Okay? That's why I, 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 I did this quote. The test of how we handle success is usually greater than how we deal with crisis. Do you, do you believe in that statement? You know, when there's a crisis, we are able to really work on it. But success is difficult. Why? Look at this. This city, Sodom, is a very rich city. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance. And how is it described? It, is, it has abundant food. So this city is a very rich city. And so the king of Sodom, when he offered and said, I get the people, you get everything. It's like saying, you're already rich and everything in Dabo city is yours. That's what the king of Sodom is saying. Now, if you were Abraham, what would you do? You say, okay, okay, yeah, all people yours, mine. Folks, remember, in Genesis chapter 12, what did God say to Abraham? Abraham, leave your family, leave your country, leave your relatives, go to this land that I will show you, and I will make your name great. I will, what? Bless you. And I will bless I will use you as a blessing to all the nation. Those who curse you, I will curse. God made a promise to Abraham. What is that? I am going to what? Bless you. So when Sodom made, the king of Sodom made an offer. I get the people, you get the spoil. Did he accept? What do you think? Did he accept? Let's see. Okay. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have what? Sworn to the Lord Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Where did he get that? The description of God. Where did he get that? From Melchizedek. He said, you know, bless you from the Lord Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Notice, he had the right theology. Everything belongs to whom? To God. You offer me? No, God has already blessed me. He has promised to bless me. So I don't need your money. I don't need those spoils. Why? Because God himself has already promised. And I have made a conviction that I will hold on to the promises of the Lord Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. So that one, no. You know why? You know why I will not accept that? Because I made a promise. I made a vow to God. Also, and I will not take a tread or a sandal, tongue, or anything that is yours, lest you would say, I have made Abraham rich. Notice the heart of Abraham. He does not want the glory of God to be what? Transferred to another person. Because if God makes him rich, he will say, because God has blessed me. Not because you have blessed me. Understand? So, the mindset of Abraham is he was so focused in really giving glory to God that the temptation, the deal of a century, giving him all the possession of Sodom was so tempting. But you know what? Because he wants to give glory to God. He said, I will not accept anything from you. Why? Because you might say, I have made Abraham rich. Okay? 
That's why in Proverbs it says, Give falsehood and lies from me. Give me neither poverty or riches, but give me only my daily bread. Why? 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 Why that? Because, look, look at verse 9. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or, I may become poor and still and so dishonor the name of my God. And the warning for all of us is this, okay? Because remember, the battle that is waging within us is really self-glory or God's glory. And when God blesses you and me, you have to be reminded. Well, let's read this together, verse 17. Go. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced me this wealth. Okay? Verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So when God blesses you, folks, whose work is that? Has God blessed you? Then you thank God. Say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my business. Thank you for uh, how you've been blessing me and my family. Give Him glory. Don't say, ah, ah, I'm really, really good. Okay? Why you're stealing the glory from God. So folks, Abraham gives glory to God. Abraham resists the temptation of success. And then he says, as we close verse 24, I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten, because remember he has people under him, and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their share. What can we learn from Abraham? Abraham knew that Aner, Eskol, and Mamre are still not followers of God. And so because he, he says, I will not get from you, king of Sodom, because I've sworn to God, I will not make it a reason that you will tell people that you made me rich. But he does not force his conviction to these people with him. Because remember, they're still pagans, right? He could have said, same with you, I don't also get. What will these three guys say? Wait, 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 wait. The policy here is this. If we, have, if we are victors, we get, we get the what? The spoils, right? Why will you force us to not accept the offer? You see, that's why he tells the king of Sodom, no, give them their share. Give, don't force your conviction to people. Give them their share. Now, as we close, what are some lessons that we can learn from this? One is this. Genesis 14 is a commentary of God of Genesis 13. When Lot decided to choose the valley, he was thinking, wow, this is the deal of the century. Wonderful place, water, all the grass, my business will really boom, right? But notice, that decision had another consequence. History weighs down on our decision. Abraham decided, okay, I will stay here. You stay in the valley. But in the end, who gets everything? Who gets everything? Abraham. Even the property of Lot, even the property of Sodom should have been given to him. Right? So, it was just a shock in their lives that Abraham did not accept the offer of the king of Sodom. But in reality, who was blessed? Lot or Abraham? Abraham. You see, folks, as you follow God, it is God who blesses us. Understand? That's one. Second thing that we can learn from all of this is this. God is sovereign. He is sovereign in the affairs of men. Big army, four kings, 30, 318 people. How can it defeat a big army? Because God is in control. Understand? God is in control. Another lesson that we can learn is this. In giving and receiving, in giving and receiving, who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? Is it you? Oh, oh check, check, check. Oh, oh big, big amount. Ah, I'm, oh, oh, sh sh I'm dropping it. Uh, from me, from me. Are you doing that? 
That's why here in CCF, we don't pass the plate. Why? So that you will not be pressured. If you want to give, give. If you don't want to give, don't give. It's up to you. It's between you and God. Do you believe that God is the possessor of heaven and earth? Can he, can he fund this ministry? Yeah. Even if you don't give. Anyway, God owns everything. So in giving and receiving, who gets the glory? But there's another lesson that we can get from this story. Lot fall, fallen, was in sin, cannot save himself, but Abraham did a rescue, right? God did the same to us. We are all what? We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glory. We are just like Lot, okay? And the wages of sin is what? Is death. But folks, God, the Father, sent somebody to rescue us from sin. Who is that? Jesus. He says, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. And because of Jesus, the name of Jesus, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So therefore, God loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Okay? So, wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think that is one illustration later, or lesson that we can get from Genesis 14. We are all led astray. We are like sheep without a shepherd. But God, in His love for us, remember, we rescue a fallen brother. Why? Because love demands it. God demonstrated His own love for us. While we were yet sinners, what did God do? Christ died for us. So, folks... Do you give God the glory? Do you help a brother and a sister that is falling in sin? Will you give him glory in everything that you do? In your struggle within you, godly conscience versus moral compromise, which will you choose? Which? So folks, let's all rise and close with a word of prayer. If you are here this morning, and maybe you need rescuing, maybe you need restoring, why don't you pray to the Lord and say, Lord God, I need your help. I am lost in my sin. I cannot even save myself. But thank you like Abraham, because... He loved Lot so much. He rescued him. The same is true with you. You love us so much. You sent your son Jesus to die for us while we were yet sinners. Father, we thank you for what Jesus has done. Thank you also for the promise that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have eternal life. And there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved it is only by the name of Jesus because Jesus died for our sins he carried all of our sins in his body for the very purpose of bringing us back to God and so Father we thank you thank you for all your blessing thank you for how you have blessed each and everyone who are here Father I pray that not only do we thank you for the blessing but Lord Remind us to also be a blessing to others. As you have blessed us, Father, I pray that we will bless others too. Lord, we know there are people who are in need. I pray that those who have, you quicken their spirit so that they will address the needs of those who do not have. We pray for those who are sick, that Lord, I pray that you will just touch their bodies, heal them completely. Thank you, Lord, for how you've been moving in the lives of our members who are sick. Thank you for Connie that she's able to walk. I pray for 
Ben, Lord, I pray for the mom of Aya, that, Lord, you have given her good resource. We know, Lord God, that you are the healer of the universe. So, Father, we just pray that you would just heal those who are sick. We pray for relationships that are hurting, that, Father, they will be reconciled. Because, Lord God, love demands it. That, Father, we need to be reconciled to one another because as the world will look at us, they will truly see that we are your disciples. So, Father, we ask and thank you for what you are doing in our midst. Continue to expand your kingdom using each and every one of us as we touch the lives of other people. We thank you. We give back all the glory, the honor, and the praise to you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, Amen and Amen.